After watching this video lecture, students will be able to write full and noble gas electron configurations for atoms and ions. You'll be able to identify core and valence electrons in the noble gas or full electron configurations, and you guys will be able to remove electrons in the correct order um, depending on the relative energies of those orbital sublevels. So electron configurations um, are ways that we write out um, basically the location of specific electrons within an atom. Um, and there's two ways that we actually represent uh, this distribution of electrons. Um, the first way is with um, orbital notation diagrams. And basically with these diagrams, um, we show uh, both the energy and the orbital type um, and the electrons present in that orbital. So you notice we have a 1s orbital um, that's filled. We have a 2s orbital um, that's filled with two electrons. And we have a 2p orbital. Um, that's filled with four electrons. This corresponds to what we would expect for um, the eight total electrons that would be present in an oxygen atom. So two of them are present in the 1s, uh, two are present in the 2s, and we have four present um, amongst the three uh, 2p orbitals. Um, so this is one diagram uh, type. Another way that we represent electron configurations are through just simple electron um, configurations. And in this case, uh, instead of drawing the boxes out, we just write out uh, the um, orbital energy level um, as well as the type of orbital. And we have a superscript that represents the number of electrons that are present in each, each orbital type. Um, so notice the 1s electron that we had, it has two electrons inside of it. So we have a superscript of two. Same thing for the 2s orbital, we have a superscript of two. And for our 2p orbitals, um, we have four total electrons there. Um, so both of these uh, could be uh, ways in which you're asked to diagram um, the distribution of electrons in an atom. So we want to make sure that we're familiar with both. So how do orbitals, uh, or excuse me, electrons fill orbitals? Um, well, the first thing that we want to think about is that basically anything that uh, is going to happen in an atom is going to happen in a way that keeps the energy of that atom low. Okay, so um, the Aufbau principle basically says that electrons are going to fill orbitals one at a time, and they're going to start with the lowest energy sublevels first. Okay, so basically we're going to start at 1s and make our way up all the way through all the other orbitals. Um, Basically, remember, as you get farther away from the nucleus, you're getting higher in energy. Um, we've discussed this in other lectures. Um, so basically, we're going to start at the bottom floor and then fill up the rooms type of thing, or, or the seats for those electrons. Um, and we're going to do so in a progressive way. Basically, some of you may have seen the filling diagram um, in this uh, type of um, presentation style, where your 1s, your 2s gets filled, then your 2p, your 3s, your 3p, your 4s, um, etc. Um, some of you also may have learned the filling procedures um, based on basically reading the periodic table as a book. So going from left to right, you know, you have your 1s orbitals, they get filled first, and the 2s, then the 2p, then your 3s, then your 3p, then your 4s, then your uh, 3d, etc. Um, I'm sure all of you guys are familiar with this at this point, um, and we'll do some practice with uh, this, this approach later. But this is the Aufbau principle. Basically, the electrons are going to fill the orbitals one at a time, um, and of course, there's a maximum of two electrons per orbital, um, and we've seen that in each of the examples that we've looked at. So uh, let's go ahead and let's uh, now discuss... Um, another set of rules. So how else do they fill? Well, no two electrons can have the same set of four quantum numbers. We've already discussed the Pauli exclusion principle um, uh, when we discuss quantum numbers. So we know that when electrons are being put into our orbitals, they're going to be put in a way or, or added in a way that's going to make the quantum numbers um, unique. Okay, so if we look at a hydrogen atom, right, it has a single electron. These are the quantum numbers for that electron. Your n equals 1, your l equals 0, because that corresponds to an s orbital. Your m sub l equals 0. Um, remember, that corresponds to the directionality of your orbital. Um, the orbital shape for s is spherical, so there's no directionality. And your m sub s, in this case, is plus 1 half. Um, that's just a convention that we use. We start with the plus 1 half, so spin up electron, um, as we have the arrow here. Um, pointing up, that's that's by convention how we add electrons initially. Um, <clears throat> helium, which has two electrons in the 1s orbital, um, is going to have the same principal quantum number, the same L, 
equal to zero because it's still the s um, orbital. Your m sub l is still going to be the same because that s orbital is spherical, um, so it doesn't have any directionality. Um, however, the first electron that's in the orbital is going to correspond or be the same as what we saw with the hydrogen, the electron um, that was in hydrogen. The second orbital, on the other hand, though, is going to have all of the same as the first, but the m sub s value is going to be different. Remember, no two electrons can have the exact same set of four quantum numbers. So one electron that's put into the helium atom is going to be spin up. The second one that's added to that 1s orbital is going to be spin down. Okay, so remember, Pauli exclusion principle, no um, two electrons can have the same uh, set of four quantum numbers. Now, when we uh, look at basically the filling procedures, um, Basically, electrons don't really want to be together if they don't have to be. Remember, electrons are negatively charged. Um, they're going to repel each other when they're put in um, to close proximity. So um, notice this is nitrogen. This is the orbital notation diagram for nitrogen. And Hund's room basically says, hey, nobody wants to be together in the orbitals if they don't have to. So as we fill up the orbitals, um, basically, we only pair when that orbital level is filled. So when we're filling um, with the seven electrons, you know, your 1s uh, orbital gets filled up. You still have electrons left over, so these have to pair. Same thing in the 2s. You know, we've used four of the seven, so there's still electrons left over. The, the 2s have to pair. Um, but when the electrons, um, the three remaining electrons, start getting put into the 2p orbital, we give them their individual seats. They basically go into the orbitals as individuals. Why? Because putting them into the same orbital, um, so the 2, you know, 2pz or 2px, whatever it may be, um, will cause an increase of energy because you'll have repulsive forces between the electrons. Okay, so in this situation, all three of these electrons would be unpaired. Now, oxygen has eight electrons, so basically you fill up that 1s, you fill up that 2s, just like you did in the um, nitrogen example. But when you get to the oxygen, uh, sorry, when you get to oxygen's 2p orbitals, you're first going to add one electron to each of the 2ps. However, because you have that eighth electron, that eighth electron has to go into the 2p orbitals, and therefore one of these sets is going, or one of these orbitals is going to have to take on a secondary electron. So pairing is going to have to occur. So the way I remember Hun's rule is basically, you know, if you're looking at it from the perspective of sitting on a bus, you know, if, if you have a completely empty bus and there's, you know, 30 empty seats and, you know, a guy who just got done at the gym comes in and comes and sits next to you, you're going to be kind of annoyed. You're going to be aggravated, right? You're going to be like, why don't you go sit in one of the other 30 seats? Um, in that same way, atoms and the electrons um, that are in those atoms uh, are going to basically be disturbed or um, have an increase of energy when pairing um, occurs. So um, if I were to look at the nitrogen example again up here, and if I would have, say, you know, taken this electron and paired it over here before I filled this orbital, uh, this nitrogen atom uh, would be less stable. It would uh, basically be a disturbed system. Okay, so um, the electrons are filling atoms in a way that lowers the energy of the overall atom um, to the greatest possible extent. So they're going to follow... Um, Hun's rule, and they're going to sit individually in those um, orbital locations um, to help minimize that energy. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of practice with making electron configurations. We're going to look at um, two versions of electronic uh, configurations that are available. Um, we have the long version, long extended version, and we have the short noble gas electron configuration. So we're going to talk about both of those, um, but first uh, let's look at the details in the periodic table. Remember, um, we have periods, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And each one of these represent basically that principal quantum number, that energy level, how far away from um, the nucleus those outermost electrons are going to be. Um, there's also a delineation um, across the table of the different blocks, so the type of orbitals that are available. So this is the S block. Um, the transition metals are the D block, okay? This is the P block, and actually helium should be over here with the S block. Um, it's kind of unique, uh, but 
and of course we have our F block. Um, so these are the uh, individual uh, locations. So what we're meaning by um, the P block is that if we're looking at say phosphorus, the last electron in a the electron configuration for phosphorus is going to be in a P orbital. Um, furthermore, I also want to kind of um, add a little extra detail as well. Remember that your D block, um, they start at three and they go to four, five, six, etc. Um, while your F block starts at um, four and five. Um, respectively. Remember there's um, some overlap that starts to occur as you get farther away from the nucleus. So now that we differentiated all the parts of the periodic table and how to use it, let's go ahead and let's write a long extended version of the electron configuration. Okay, so um, when when they ask you to write the electron configuration for something um, and they don't say, you know, short version or normal gas, that means that they're referring to the long version. So even though they don't say the long version, um, you want to assume that unless indicated <clears throat> unless the um, opposite or, or something different is indicated. <clears throat> now, um, the way I approach the long version is, first of all, you're always going to start at the beginning um, whenever you're doing the long version. So what I mean by the beginning is you're going to start in the 1s orbital, um, and you're going to go and read the periodic table until you get to the element that you're um, looking at. So um, carbon is what we're looking at here. Okay, so... Um, in order to get through carbon, I have to pass through the 1s um, orbitals. There are two elements in that orbital. Each one has an additional electron. So I should have a 1s2 orbital in my um, electron configuration. Now I'm not to carbon yet, so I have to continue. So I now go back to the beginning of the sentence, or the beginning of the um, periodic table, but now down to the second row. So now I'm in the 2s orbital. Um, there's two elements here. Um, I am not to carbon yet, so there's two additional electrons in that 2s orbital, so I write 2s2, um, <clears throat> two. Um, and I continue on to the right. So um, now I'm in the p block, the 2p block, so I have one, two um, uh, spaces or elements until I've reached carbon, so I'm going to have two electrons in my 2p orbital. So Basically, each space um, for an element is representing the addition of an electron. That electron is being added into the um, specific orbital uh, block that it's located in, um, as well as the energy level. So that's why, you know, the hydrogen and helium, <clears throat> those electrons would go into the 1s. The lithium and beryllium, those would go into um, the 2s, um, and both uh, the electrons... Um, that would correspond to um, those counted from the boron and carbon space um, would go there. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, the second electron in this element is a boron electron or a, you know, here a beryllium electron. I'm not saying that. We're just counting. Okay, remember the identity of an element is based on the number of protons. So um, the electron bookkeeping that we're doing here um, is basically just a tool. Okay, um, so... Your electron configuration for carbon should be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Um, there's a total of six electrons in the carbon atom, and so all of your superscript should add up to that overall number of electrons. And if I wanted to write the orbital notation diagram, this is how I would do it. Notice um, the 1s and the 2s, the lower levels have been filled up and uh, subsequently paired because it's been forced. Um, but notice that there's no pairing in the 2p orbitals. They are sitting separately. Um, so that they can be happy. Now, um, the noble gas electron configurations, um, it, the nice thing about this is that it shortens the work you have to do. You don't have to start at the 1s. So instead of, instead of starting at the 1s, what you're going to do is you're going to look at where your element is located on the periodic table and then start at the previous noble gas. So in this case, they've told us um, that we're looking at sodium. Okay, so sodium is right here. It's in the 3s orbital, so we know our, our final electron should be in the 3s. Um, and so what we do is we go from the sodium to the previous noble gas. So neon is our previous noble gas in this situation. So what we do is we write neon in brackets, and then we count over. So the next electron is sodium, right? And it's going to be in a 3s um, orbital. I am at sodium, so 3s1 is what we're going to write um, as the end portion of our 
normal gas electron configuration. Um, something I do want to mention, if you are asked to give the electron configuration of a noble gas, you cannot write just something like this. Okay, so if I ask you to give me the electron um, configuration for noble gas or the short uh, electron configuration for um, one of your noble gases, you can't just write the noble gas in brackets. Okay, that you have to use the previous noble gas or you have to use the longhand version. So for neon, it's 1s2, 2s2, uh, 2p6. Okay, so that's what we would expect there. Or the shortened version, we could do helium in brackets and then 2s2, 2p6. Okay, so um, this would not be acceptable, um, elect an acceptable electron configuration for the noble gas uh, neon. Um, either of these two would be, either the long version or the short version. So electron configurations um, uh, are basically a nice layout of um, basically where all the electrons are located in um, an atom. So we don't have to draw any complicated pictures. We can just, you know, have something nice uh, and neat that's on paper. Um, <clears throat> so while we're at it, let's go ahead and let's look at um, some details associated with um, the valence electrons and uh, core electrons. Okay, so... First of all, valence electrons are electrons that are in the outermost um, orbitals of an atom. So, and they're used for bonding, okay? So the valence electrons are the exterior electrons um, that are used in all the bonding and all the reactivity that we're gonna be discussing from here on out. The core electrons, on the other hand, those are the ones that are not involved in bonding and those are the ones that um, basically, they, they're called core electrons because they're away from the reactive sets. Okay, um, so uh, being able to identify these, what I want you guys to notice is that um, the core electrons can easily be identified based on the previous noble gas. So this is the longhand electron configuration of sulfur. Now, if I were to write this in the shorthand, what we would have is, would be, excuse me, um, neon and 3s2, 3p4, right? Okay, so this would be our core set. This would be our um, valence set, okay? So these are the electrons that are uh, responsible for bonding, and these are core electrons, okay? So um, the electron configurations can help you easily identify what are valence and what are core electrons. Um, the core electrons are going to correspond to the electron configuration of the previous noble gas. Um, so obviously this is important uh, when we start talking about ionization energies and things of that sort. So this will come back. So let's go ahead and let's talk about the stability of atoms. Um, we've talked about core versus valence electrons. Um, the valence electrons are the outermost electrons that are involved in bonding and things of that sort. So atoms, you know, pick up electrons so that they can gain stability or they lose electrons so they can gain um, stability. Basically, things are happening with those valence electrons um, that allow the atom to become or to enter a lower energy state. Um, and so with that in mind or that concept in mind, um, there are certain elements that are going to be um, more stable due to the way the electrons are configured in their shells. Okay, so we know that the noble gases, we know that all of these are some of the least reactive elements on the periodic table. And the reason that is, is because they have completely filled shells. Um, so basically, they don't need any more electrons, they don't want to give up any more electrons, they've reached that um, most stable state. Okay, and so these are going to be um, some of your most stable configurations. So completely filled shells, confer a, a unique stability. In that same way, um, electron configurations with half-filled shells are usually um, more stable than those who have um, basically oddly filled shells. So basically something like this, you know, if there's three uh, open orbitals and you have three electrons, basically that 2p set is half-filled. There's a total of six that could possibly be placed into um, those orbitals, but there's only three, so it's half-filled. Um, so basically, these are going to be, this this element is going to be slightly lower in energy than something that had to be paired up. Um, so you add an extra electron here or here, whatever that may be. 
Now remember there are repulsive forces between um, electrons because you know you put two ends of the same magnet together they repel same thing occurs with you know a charged uh, particle so you put two electrons together they want to repel each other so not having those repulsive forces converts a slight stability um, in the elements um, that have these uh, half filled shells that you see here now there's also some other unique uh, things to think of so the half filled shell um, feature uh, actually shows up um, in some of the elements electron configurations. Um, so we talk about half filled shells, you know, conferring and completely filled shells con conferring some stability. Um, so what ends up happening with some of the elements is that the electron configurations that we see for them um, end up being um, altered from what we would expect based on reading the electron configuration from the periodic table. So basically, you know, what we would maybe write out is actually in reality slightly different. So copper, for example, the expe expectation that we would have here um, would be that we would have a completely filled S shell and that uh, the D um, orbital has nine electrons. Uh, what ends up happening is that uh, electrons from the 4S end up um, getting um, placed into the 3D, so that basically there's there's kind of a transfer, so that that half filled uh, or that partially filled shell now becomes a completely filled shell. Um, so it confers some stability. Um, it's just what happens. The same thing happens with chromium. Um, you end up with two half filled shells into, instead of a full and oddly filled shell. Um, basically, the stability that ends up forming here um, is what we see. They are reality. Um, and it's, it's what we can measure spectro, spectroscopically. So there are a bunch more examples where um, these electrons are seen um, moving to confer stability based on, you know, half-filled, completely filled shells that we just discussed. Um, however, we're going to ignore these exceptions. We're not going to worry about those. The only ones we're going to worry about are copper and chromium. Um, we're going to just focus on those and, and let those be the exceptions. They make the most sense. Um, it'll make it easy for us to proceed. So let's go ahead and let's do a little bit of practice. Um, I make sure that we are on track for um, writing correct electron configurations. So they want us to write both the short and long hand electron configurations for Krypton. Okay, so first things first is we want to identify Krypton, excuse me, um, on the periodic table. Okay, so it's right here. It's one of those noble gases. Um, so remember for our noble gases, we are not allowed to just write the noble gas um, in a bracket. Um, that's not an ac acceptable electron configuration. Um, so let's make sure that we're avoiding that. So uh, let's go ahead and write out the long version. Um, remember, we're always going to start at the very beginning. Um, so 1s is the first set. So we have 1s. There's and we have that because hydrogen, helium, they're both in the 1s. Now we're going to continue down to the 2s because we've gone all the way across. Um, from lithium and beryllium, we're not yet to krypton, so 2s2, so there's two electrons there. Now we continue over into the p block, the 2p block, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 um, uh, elements that we've went through, um, so those six additional electrons are going to be in that 2p. We're not yet to krypton, so we're going to come back, um, and we're going to continue on uh, with our 3s, Okay, so we have our 3s, there's two elements there, and we're not yet to krypton, krypton so we're going to continue um, across the table. Um, so aluminum, silicon, all these, so there's six. Now we're at argon, that's still not krypton, um, so 3s6. Okay, so now we've entered um, the uh, 4s block, which we see right here. Okay, so we have 4s. Two electrons that are going to be coming from there. We potassium and the calcium. Um, we're not yet to krypton, so we're going to continue across. Now, um, notice, guys, that we have now entered the D block. Okay, remember the D block is going to be off by one. So the, since this is 4s, these are now the 3d. Okay, so 3d. We're going to go all the way across this this uh, uh, row because there aren't any. Um, we aren't yet to krypton, and if we count all these, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, okay, and that makes sense with the number of electrons we know um, can fit into a d orbital. Um, and now we're going to go back to the four, um, four p's, okay, and there's six of those, so um, if we write that down, we're going to have 4p6, 
um, as our uh, completed electron configuration. So this is the longhand. Now the shorthand, remember, we take um, the periodic table and we go to the previous noble gas. So in this case, argon is going to be the previous noble gas. It gets left in brackets. And we write everything that occurs after argon. Okay, so in this case, everything from uh, 4s on is going to be written after the argon because everything else here should be representing those core electrons that correspond to the argon element. So 4s2, 3d10, okay, 4p6. Okay, so this is the longhand, this is the shorthand, okay, and they're both um, acceptable methodologies or approaches. Okay, another way that questions could be asked um, is that you could be given an electron configuration and asked to identify the element. Okay, so um, if I'm given this electron configuration, I can just basically follow along on the periodic table to identify what element is present. So 1s2, okay, I, uh, those are being used. 2s2, those are being used. And then 2p5. So the electron of the element that we're going to be identifying is going to be found in the 2p block. Now I'm going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So fluorine has 5 electrons in the 2p orbital. Okay, so the element that we're identifying is fluorine. Okay, so you would take the same approach with any other um, example when given um, an electron configuration. Okay, so now that we've talked about electron configurations, I want to talk about how to write electron configurations associated with ions. So we know that chlorine um, is wanting to pick up electrons in order to be like its nearest noble gas. And when it does that, it forms what's known as a chloride ion. Okay, so it's going to have a Cl minus charge. If I were to write the electron configuration for this chloride ion, what you need to consider is that it's going to have the same electron configuration as chlorine, the neutral version, except it has one additional electron, which is why it has a minus charge. So when we write this out, we follow the same protocol that we have discussed in previous slides. Instead of having only five um, electrons in that p orbital, the chloride ion has an additional electron, and hence the electron configuration will look like this. Okay, so very similar, but it has additional electrons. In that same way, if we treat our sodium uh, atom, okay, we get this electron configuration that you see here, but a sodium ion has a positive one charge because it has lost an electron. So in this particular case, my electron configuration is going to look like the following. Okay, notice I have removed um, an electron from that 3s orbital, and now I get this electron configuration here. Now, the other thing I want you guys to notice that is that in these particular examples, we have argon and we have neon that are the nearest noble gases to um, sodium and chlorine. And because of that, what you should also notice is that the sodium ion is going to have the same electron configuration as neon, and the chloride ion is going to have the same electron configuration as argon. Okay, and so the formation of ions is something we talk about in more detail as we progress into the bonding unit um, of this class. So we'll discuss that in more detail. So now that we understand um, how to write the electron configurations for um, ions of specific species, I want to show you or discuss um, exceptions that occur uh, amongst elements in the D block. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, where we should pull our electrons from um, and discuss how to write our electron configurations for ions of transition elements. So if we go ahead and we look at the noble gas electron configuration of the transition element vanadium, we have the following um, electron configuration. And let's say, uh, for example, we were to go ahead and look at the plus two ion of vanadium. What ends up being our electron configuration is the following. And some of you may be asking, well, why are the electrons from the s orbitals being pulled first? And really the reasoning behind this is kind of beyond the scope of this particular class. But what you need to understand is that as you get further and further out, um, from the nucleus with respect to orbitals, what ends up happening is that the distance uh, between the orbitals uh, starts to kind of decrease. And so 
what ends up happening is sometimes we have uh, overlap of those orbitals and some of the orbitals that have been filled first normally um, end up having electrons removed from them um, prior to what we would normally anticipate. So in the case of um, D block elements, okay, what you guys are going to do is you're going to remove um, S electrons before D electrons. Okay, um, and so you're always going to start with the S's um, and then move into the D's if necessary. So let's say we were forming a vanadium plus 3 ion, we would go ahead and start removing electrons from the D orbital. Okay, so um, this is just a protocol that we see and we follow with the for our transition elements and removing their electrons. So problems like the one seen here um, may require uh, the mixing or, or usage of um, both orbital notation diagram and electron configuration. So they want us to, to write the electron configuration, the, the noble gas electron configuration, so the short version, um, in both of these examples. So the element with one n paired 5p electron that forms a covalent compound with fluorine. Okay, so what that's saying is that first we have to figure out um, an element that has an unpaired 5p electron. Okay, so first of all, we know that um, we're going to have something uh, that has a um, unpaired electron in in the in the five p orbital. So one, two, three, four, five. So five p. So we know um, one of the elements is going to be in this row. Okay. So um, now, if we continue on we can go ahead and look at what the um, 5p orbitals will look that look like for each of the atoms in that row. Um, so for um, indium, right, we would have 5p1, excuse me, okay, um, for 10, it would be 5p2, for antimony, um, It'd be 5p3. Okay, for tellurium, that's going to be 5p4. Okay, and for iodine, it's going to be 5p5. And of course, for um, xenon, we're going to have 5p6. Now, notice that portion of the electron configuration is not really going to tell us anything about um, the pairing or um, lack of pairing for the electrons. What we actually need to look at is um, the orbital notation diagrams. So if we're looking at the 5p orbitals, um, we can look at how each of these would work. Okay, so indium in this case, it would have one unpaired electron, right? So it's an option, okay? Um, if we look at 10, right, it has two electrons in the 5p, so it has two unpaired electrons, so it's not an option. Um, antimony would have three unpaired electrons, so it's not an option. Tellurium would have two unpaired electrons, so it's not an option. Iodine would have one paired electron, so it's an option, okay, and xenon would have six unpaired, or a six paired electron, so it wouldn't have any unpaired. Okay, so it's not an option. So the two options that we have here are indium um, and iodine. Um, and so they want to know the electron configuration, the noble gas electron configuration for the element um, that would form a covalent bond um, with fluorine. Okay, so um, indium is a metal. Um, so a metal and a non-metal is going to give you an ionic compound. So we know that that's not the option. Iodine is a covalent or a, a non-metal. Non-metals and metals, or non-metals and non-metals, they give you covalent compounds. So what they're asking for is the uh, electron configuration for iodine. So we're going to do the shortened version. Um, so the previous noble gas is krypton, right? So we're going to put that into the bracket, okay? 5s2, 4d10, 5p5. Okay, and that should be our electron configuration for um, our iodine. 
So notice for this problem, we kind of had to combine um, both our understanding of the electron configuration and the filling procedure, um, as well as an orbital notation diagrams to be able to visualize if we had paired or unpaired electrons. So obviously they're both important for being able to ascertain um, the correct compounds or the correct answers, um, especially when we're looking at the creation of compounds. So now we need to figure out the um, noble gas electron configuration for the um, alkali earth metal that would occur after radium. So basically what would be right here. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and start with um, radon. Okay, so it's our previous noble gas um, that we actually know. <clears throat> um, and we're going to go across here. Here, so 7s. Um, so 7s2, um, then we need to drop down to the D block, um, so that's going to bring us to, um, um, oh, sorry, the, the F block, so 5f14, because we're going to go along the bottom trace here, that's going to bring us back up here, that's going to bring us to 6d10, because we're not yet to the element we need, um, and then once we do 6d10, um, as you see here, okay, we're going to go across the P block, okay, so 7P6, okay, and then once we go back to the beginning here, we're now going to be um, in the 8S2, okay, so this would be your electron configuration for the alkali earth metal that would be present there. So we now come full circle, um, you're not being asked just to write electron configurations, um, or noble gas electron configurations, but you're being asked to solve problems with your knowledge of um, both the electron configurations um, that you are able to write and your orbital notation diagrams that you're able to write, um, but additionally your understanding between of ionic and covalent bonding um, in this situation, um, prediction of elements, proper filling of um, orbitals with electrons. These are all the rules and, and ideas that you're going to have to be able to utilize in order to solve problems um, for the rest of the semester.